All right, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here at Elixir uh, 2017. Uh, this is my first Elixir conference for the Elixir conference. I've been going to them uh, in New York for the last few years. Uh, I'm from Ottawa, Canada. And a huge thanks out to the organizing committee. Uh, it's been a great conference. Uh, it's wrapping up, but I'll still be here until the end of the day. If you have any questions, if my talk goes right to the end, you don't get to ask them. Uh, but I want to hop right in. So there's three main areas I want to talk about today. The first is this idea of automation uh, versus autonomy and how we can get these zero-click deploys, these, these uh, autonomous things working for us so that way we can focus more on code. Uh, the next is the deployment pipeline. So this is where we can look at various aspects of first what is a pipeline and how you can work it into, uh, into your projects. And then the last, um, and the last one might get a little bit cut off is this idea of immutable infrastructure and how you can actually start to bring up and tear down uh, infrastructure on the fly for your needs, even if you are uh, just a one-person uh, Elixir team. So the title of the talk actually stems from a scene in Forgetting Sarah Marshall where he's learning to surf and he's told, I need you to get up, but I need you to do nothing. And so there's a similar kind of feel in, in software development where your tests should run when it's right for them to run. Uh, you want to migrate the database when there's migrations to be run. You want to go to production when you're ready to go to production. I want you to do nothing. But that doesn't mean you're actually not doing anything. There actually is a lot of work that goes in behind getting all this stuff uh, to work for you. So it works for you, but it's not free. All right, so just because uh, something's free doesn't mean that there's not going to be some sort of a hidden cost. And, um, and so it's going to be resources to actually manage that automation. Um, but similar to test-driven development, once you learn it, once you get good at it, then it far outweighs the, uh, the costs. So in negotiations, there's this thing called uh, BATNA. And, um, what it really means is it's the best alternative to doing nothing. So if you're not automating, then what is the alternative? And here you've got ideas like you know, do you really want to have click infrastructure? Um, and then with your click infrastructure, do you really want to maintain your 38-step uh, deployment guide for how you move things on to uh, a new server? And like I said before, this kind of aligns nicely with the uh, benefits and challenges of test-driven development. You might be an excellent developer. Uh, and you might think, well, test-driven development, that's just development, so I, I can do it. It's easy. It's not. It actually takes practice in doing it. The same thing with automation, same thing as writing these scripts. Just because you're good at development doesn't mean that's going to port over nicely to writing these, these uh, automated scripts. Uh, and it does take uh, time and effort. So let's hop into what this means to be, uh, to have automation. So you can picture a developer, they're ready to cut a release, so maybe they send a Slack command to their build server and says, go, go build me a release. And then when that gets back, they come back from their coffee break and they go check, and then they're actually gonna deploy it to their EC2 instances, and then it goes live, they check, they do some tests. So those little bits of functionality, those, those steps that you're grouping together as one coherent step, that is your automation. That's really where you're writing these things to do stuff for you, but it's a human that decides. It was a human that said, I am ready for a release. And then it was a human that had to go check, all right, is the build server ready? It's finished, all right, now I can go and deploy. In the automotive industry, you hear a lot about autonomous vehicles and that, and this is where the definition kind of stems from. So in addition to that automation, the decisions about when something should be run and any follow-up actions is left to non-humans. So we're still talking about doing things automatically, but the humans aren't doing the judgment part. It's other scripts that are doing it for us. So obviously there's a place in the middle. This is where we want to kind of to string together multiple automated steps with triggers so that way you can get more of your pipeline uh, to work without a human involved. So there's obviously going to be degrees of autonomy and uh, you're not going to start from day one to have everything be zero touch, zero click. 
So how do we get to zero? And the first step, unfortunately, means you have to learn about what you're doing. If you don't know how to deploy by hand, if you can't go to your computer and deploy it however you want, then you can't automate it. Right? So the first step is really understanding what tasks do you need to do and how can you do them uh, automatically. But first, just by hand. And by hand, I don't mean writing it out. I'm referring more to going on the server, scripting it out, trying out a few operating systems, looking at different build packages, tools. Just try and do something so that you can do it once manually. Then that next step is the automation. Well, there was three scripts that I had to ping together and check on some error codes and that. So here, the best way to learn is to teach. So what you're doing is you're teaching the computer how to do what you had just done manually. And so it took you two hours to fumble through. Now it can do in 10 minutes. That next step is to write your meta scripts. And this is where you want to figure out, well, me as a human, I know when I want to deploy. Are there things that I can teach the computer so that it knows that it should deploy without me having to interject? And so here, you're teaching the computer when to run the tasks and how to react when they fail. So you're splitting your, your, your automation into really two parts. The first part are the actions. These are all the things that you might know how to automate. You've got mix, ecto, um, uh, gen, migrate. You've got mix tests. You can um, back up your database in Postgres. You can run smoke tests. You can do all of these actions, and that is the automation piece. The triggers are looking for file changes, getting postbacks from third-party services, uh, integrating with uh, Git hooks, um, getting uh, version change if a PR is merged, things like that. These are triggers that their only responsibility is to then kick off those actions. So just to run through a few of the triggers, because you might not be uh, as familiar with them as you are the other automations. So I notify just allows you to listen to a file or a directory. So here, we're going to just make sure a file exists. We're going to watch for changes, and then we're going to do something. And we're splitting out the trigger from the actual action, because sometimes the computer might not do it when we want to do it. So we always want to be able to get in there and run those actions by hand should things go awry. There's another one for FS Watch. So this one here just works uh, uh, cross-platform. Here, we're going to look for a directory change, and we're going to compile and test our code. So we've just achieved continuous testing. Uh, don't do this. There's a great package out there called Mixed Test Watch, and I'm just going to hop over into it real quick to give you a quick demo of it. So here, I've got a little stock market application. And so that first step is really just to understand how to call it. So here, I'm just fumbling through, and there's a yield. It takes three things. $10, I get 10 cents, and it's quarterly, and I can run it through it. That's really that manual part. I have to know how to execute my stuff before I can automate it. Then I go learn about mixed test. Mixed test allows me to run it once. But if I ever wanted to start work on more things, then I have to constantly switch back and forth. So I can just get a file watcher running. And uh, I integrated the stale uh, from this morning's talk, a feature I didn't know about. But now I can start to add in extra tests. So by default, and this is just using an alias, I just say, no, no. By default, it's stale. Um, I want to go in here, and options have a split, just the difference between the buy and the sell. And I want to check out zero. So I just save the file. It's automatically going to pick up the change. And what's nice is with the stale dash, it knows to just run what I need to. And I didn't change my thing. So, um, so this is how the split between the actual automation piece and just that little trigger so that it knows when things should run properly. Uh, so we've got, you can pull. So again, here. You're going to check, file exists, do some action, remove that trigger, and then you're going to sleep again. Don't do this, right? Use cron. Um, but it's just giving you an idea of what's available. Because again, if your system, for whatever reason, doesn't have cron, or you don't want to spend the time to, to learn it, as opposed to having nothing and you going on there daily and running it manually, 
you can have that sort of polling script run. Um, if you want to get integration directly within your application, then you can use a cron-like wrapper that allows you to do scheduling. And with Erlang and Elixir, it's very easy to do these kind of tasks with a, um, a cron-like syntax to do things daily, every 15 minutes, every five minutes, what have you. And finally, the one that's, that's really good are these, uh, these git hooks. So the one that, that I use a lot is the post commit. So after a commit, do some stuff. So it goes in the git hooks directory. Uh, you can grab the last message, and then you can do what you want. You can take any kind of action that you'd like. So when I talked about those triggers, there's really a few dimensions to look at them. The first is the idea of push-pull. So with push, the event is delivered to you. And that's really something like an I notify. File changes, you get notified right away. Uh, API uh, uh, makes some decision and does a post back. Um, the polling is where you have to ask the question, and you have to check for the state change. And so here, um, you've set up a, a cron job to check for the, the liveness of a service. So the cron job is just going to check. One isn't necessarily better than the other. There are, there are advantages, disadvantages to both. With a push, the event comes, and then if you don't capture it properly, it's gone. Um, you'd either have to try and get it to trigger again from the source, or again, call those actions directly. With a pull, obviously, you don't get the event right away. So if you're pulling every hour, and it happens one minute after, then you have to wait the 59 minutes for it to come through. The next angle is explicit versus implicit. And this comes down to, again, your alternative to doing nothing. So explicit is a legitimate, real trigger. So this is the primary source triggered a change or had some sort of change. Implicit is a secondary source. So again, you can ask your build server, circle CI, hey, is the build finished? Maybe you don't have postback set up. So you just are constantly polling it to ask, are you done, are you done? When it answers yes, and I finished successfully, that's an explicit trigger because it was legitimate. Maybe you don't have um, uh, uh, the money or the resources or the time to go into Circle CI, so you do it yourself. And uh, what you do is you just touch a file, smoke.past. So that's a secondary kind of source where you're inferring that an event had happened, and it's tangential to push or pull. You'll notice here I had the explicit one as a pull and the implicit one as a, um, um, as a push. And it, they're really two different ways to look at how the events can be triggered. So we're going to automate. Obviously, we want to automate everything. Um, but that's not practical. Uh, if you are even remotely familiar with golf, 18 holes, you want a lower score, I'm a terrible golfer. Uh, and if I want to improve my golf game, I'm not going to go to uh, the fairgrounds and hit off the tee. And the reason I'm not going to do this is because I only get to have 18 shots off the tee in a game. But I'm scoring 100, 120. So 20% of my time is off the tee. So if I want to get better at golf, I'm going to practice on my short game, I'll practice on my putting, I'm going to practice where I spend most of my time. So um, how this comes back to uh, automation is don't automate building up your infrastructure from scratch first. Automate the deployment part. Automate the fact that when a commit goes in, that it can go push an update or build a release. Do the things you're doing more often. You build a server once. Maybe you rebuild it every month. But hopefully, your project, you're committing every day, and you're doing this a lot of times. So you want to focus on the things you're doing more often to get that pipeline as automated as you can. So we're going to automate our $5 idea. And for me, a $5 idea is something that I'm willing to spend at least, but hopefully no more than $5 a month to try out. And for that, um, we're going to get into the deployment pipeline. So our $5 idea is solving one of those hard problems in computer science, which is naming things. So it's a service that is live. SSL is unfortunately turned off. As part of preparation for this, I exhausted all my let's encrypt uh, attempts. <laughs> and I found that out about an hour ago. So, um, but what's neat is that the, uh, the, the Phoenix app actually can tell if there is a cert involved or not. So HTTPS won't work right now. Hopefully tomorrow it will go back on. Um, but here, it's just a matter of you ask a question, I need a name for my great talk on OK. That's going to go through, and it's there. If only there were a great way to send back, uh, to send back messages through some sort of channel. 
and get it right away. <laughs> maybe, maybe next week. All right, so that's our thing. And we're going to kick off uh, deployment. And that is too small. So I've got a change here I'm going to make. So let's get out of here. All right, so we're going to start it up. IEX, big S, Phoenix server. Always start it with IEX. That way, if you screw something up, you can poke it really easily as opposed to trying to attach an already running. So it's in there. Should be running. Let's see. All right, up and running. And I'm going to stop it, actually, and just unstash my changes. Perfect. Start it up again. Much better color scheme. So we're going to push this to production. So we stop that. We love the work. OK. And I'm going to use this task version up. So uh, version up is just going to go and peek and say, oh, I'm at 3, 2, 1. I'm going to make it 3, 2, 2. And that's all it does. There's some other automations going on here now, but I didn't plug it into this thing called version up. I plugged it into my Git hook. That my Git hook checks, hey, is there a new version asked for? Cool. I'm going to go and do some deployment. And let's figure out how we did that. But before we do, uh, it takes a few minutes to do the build, so we'll, we'll talk for a bit. So again, this is the problem we're solving, that hard problem. Uh, so now we're going to get into this pipeline. So uh, pipeline, I'm talking about your deployment management, release management, release pipeline. Uh, it's a word that you actually hear a lot now. Um, and it refers to automating your continuous X. So it started 20 years ago, probably longer, but with uh, uh, ThoughtBot, or uh, sorry, ThoughtWorks and Cruise Control, getting that continuous integration, always merging in all your code. Uh, delivering deployment, delivery just means I could deliver it, but I decided not to. Deployment is, no, I'm going to prod every time. Testing and monitoring, um, we did a little bit of continuous testing with that mixed test watch, but you can also kind of get into the larger scale of Chaos Monkey, like where part of your application is actually bringing down your application to make sure if it comes down, you can handle it. So, we're going to focus on the integration delivery, kind of in the deployment testing, and no time for, for monitoring. So this pipeline, you've got build, test, deploy. And then you've got your monitor. So all those continuous Xs all have things that will build into your pipeline. Uh, you've got your tools for doing uh, UI testing with PhantomJS or Selenium, your X unit at the core. But at the root, a pipe takes an event, some sort of trigger, something that decides, hey, something should happen, a precondition. Actions are performed. And then it either drops a message saying, I worked, or it feeds back out saying, I didn't work. And the only real thing that we know that comes out of the pipeline would be some assets, some artifacts, so your release. Maybe you have some uh, test results that you can publish on a, on a page. There was actually, um, we'll switch over here for a second. So this is a, uh, a, a language that I worked on ages ago, qa.umple.org. See how the internet is. Looks like it's not too, all right. So uh, this, for instance, would be some of the assets that are drawn. So this simple page, which tracks um, uh, this, this language for high-level modeling, um, has been running relatively unchanged for 10 years. And it's allowed the team to really focus on the features. And the only real change they had to do was uh, the app needed Java 8. This is using an old version of Cruise Control. It needed Java 6. So on boot up, we just do a little swap over point, start Cruise Control, and swap back. But again, with a lot of this upfront work with the automation, once you set it, you don't forget it, but it can work for quite a long time without you having to be overly involved. So let's start with one pipe. We have a version that's released, and we'll go poke at our current version. 
Um, I'm hoping it hasn't finished yet, but it might have. So we can see its status. All right. Let's be nice, everyone. <laughs> OK. So where are we here? Oh, so uh, the internet flaked out. I'm sorry. So internet flaked out. Um, I'm only on a $5 idea, so I don't have a separate build server. So this is my build server. Internet went down. It didn't deploy. My talk actually veers in two directions. If it failed, it's good. If it passed, it's also good. What's nice is it's still running. What's really great about Elixir releases, uh, so Erlang releases, is that when it fails, it doesn't take down the system. There's no this interim state where you are partially done your work, so it's going to keep running. Uh, we'll leave it at that, and we'll come back to it in a bit. So we have this release that we want. Test it, tag it, prepare it, release it, retain it. Retain it's just a fancy word for save it. And here I'm talking about saving it off of the disk somewhere else, somewhere in the cloud. So that's why I'm calling it retain. And then launch. And that's again going to store that in there. So that way we know more pipes are coming. And when those other pipes come, we don't need to necessarily do the same testing or preparing or releasing. We just want to grab it and go. So that version thing is right here. Um, I'm not going to talk about semantic versioning. And it doesn't apply when it's your application, right? My Phoenix application, I can version it however you want, right? You aren't overly impacted as a developer when Firefox releases it as a major release or a minor or a patch. So major, minor, patch, um, it's internal to you, and, but we can actually use that to help guide those triggers to do certain types of automation. So I have a, um, a MISC uh, version tasks. It allows you to poke at your application. It tries to be relatively agnostic to um, what's going on around you, so it doesn't overly hook into things. So I can say, what is my, so I can get all the output. I can ask for my current version. I can do a lot of read-only things. I can get the next version. And again, next version has three implications, patch, minor, or major. So here it knows this idea of minor or major. I can also get the name, which is what kind of release am I in? Like a 4.0.0 is a major release, so a 4.1.0 is a minor release, and a, our current version, which is 3.2.2, is, uh, is a patch release. And I can use all these little bits of information. And there's also uh, some code generation available with it as well to help do a lot of the code that I'm going to be posting on here in front of you now. So we have our script, and uh, this is our, our Git hook. And we're just going to ask, hey, does it look like there was a new version? Um, if there was, we're going to trigger something. If not, uh, we're just going to put a little bit of breadcrumbs so that way when I'm running it, I can tell the difference between it's hooked up and it has nothing to do and I didn't set the permissions right, or I didn't hook it up right. So you see a lot of times that I'll drop little breadcrumbs so I can see what's on. And when we looked at the release version, yes, it wasn't purple, so that was a huge hint. But the other was that I dropped the version right on there. It doesn't have to be on your main page, but that way, just little breadcrumbs so I can be confident that indeed it was released. Because some of your features might actually be internal and you won't see them directly. So What's that trigger? Or sorry, what's that automation here? Run your tests, tag in a git, and do this magical deploy. We're now going to run through what that deploy is. And uh, these notes are available online. Um, you can grab from the repositories. I'm more kind of trying to show you at a very high level that the steps involved aren't that difficult, but they will be quite unique. I don't overly use umbrella applications. I use small applications that I'll then tie in as uh, mixed libraries. But not all of them are public. So I might have to fetch from three repositories to build everything together. But again, get your code in the server, check out the appropriate branch, and then this is the important part to work with distillery, to work with the releases. 
Uh, Distillery uh, really switched from the original EXRM to just build you that Erlang release. And what we're doing here is we're getting the dependencies, compiling, doing some uh, JavaScript stuff, and then preparing all of the uh, assets to go. We're doing hot code upgrades, so we just need the dash dash upgrade. And obviously, a huge thank you to Paul for uh, his great work with EXRM and then the follow on with, with Distillery. This is going to create you an Erlang release. So at a high level, because we only have time to learn so much, it just takes a mixed project into an Erlang project. It also gives you command line things to start it, stop it, go in the foreground, attach it, and all that, uh, as well as some hot, uh, hot code swaps that are available. A lot more commands are available. These are sort of the, the high level view for it. The retain, put it where you want. Uh, you can put it uh, in GitHub, Box, uh, Dropbox, AWS S3, doesn't matter. Um, for this here, I'm just using Bitbucket, it's free, uh, and it's easy to, to push to the cloud with a commit. I'm not showing you this full script, just the important part is where it gets dropped. Again, that's the part that you need to discover manually so that you can work it through your automation. It's an upsert for the start. Am I already running? Do a hot upgrade. If I'm not running, then do a start. A shout out to two libraries that can help do this for you. So um, eDeliver can wrap deployment for distillery or EXRM. Um, Bootleg is a newer library I just found out here at this conference, and it's got a very capistrano feel to it. Um, and so we're up. We're live. I focus on deployment first. So this was the first version that went out that did nothing. So now we can increase our pipeline. We can throw a build machine in there. So that way, if I'm doing a demo, I don't have to worry about the internet going down, crashing my build. Uh, same things are going to happen. I need to build, test, tag, release, launch. Maybe I do some extra testing now. And then the deploy is really, instead of doing those first three steps, go grab the release and launch it. Or again, maybe you're using Heroku. That's fine. You still have to know how to deploy to Heroku, how to get that done. And again, maybe you're using Circle CI for, for your build. So I'm not saying that you have to build all your own infrastructure, but you do have to know what you're doing. You have to plan out your pipeline. So if you're using bootleg, then it needs a build server. So again, build somewhere, deploy somewhere. But guess what? Why don't you just build and deploy in the same? So again, just because bootleg has that separation, uh, it was the same with, uh, with Capistrano as far as your targets. Here's where my web goes, my database goes and that. You can consolidate back down to the one. It's more you need to know what's, what's going on to build and deploy to your production. And again, maybe you want to throw in a stage surgeon there. Maybe you want to actually build it with Docker. So you'll load up your core OS inside Docker to get your, your releases. You're going to use um, some sort of uh, SaaS for your stage. And for your production, it's a bunch of EC2 instances that are behind an um, auto-scaling group. Regardless, you still need to know what you're doing. So there is no magic silver bullet that can get you there. So start simple, start small, understand what's going on. So when you go look at something like Bitbucket Pipelines, you're like, hey, that's scripting, right? That's bash just hidden in YAML. Oh, but. I'm using local repositories, it doesn't have my key, so I need to learn how to set that up. Or Circle CI workflows. Again, this looks very familiar. So it, I'm not bashing these. I'm more trying to say that you need to know what goes in those steps. So if you don't need to know, if you don't know that you need to do a depth get before you do a test, then Circle CI is not going to be able to help you. Uh, their documentation will, but out of the box, no. So you still need to understand, you still need to know how to do it manually. The other is some of the permissions that they need are a little bit scary. Uh, full administration, uh, you know, full access, can add members, can do what have you. And if you're a small team, maybe you're using a private Git repo and storing your, your SSL certs in there and your keys and oopsies. You're plugged into CircleCI, so all that just went out into uh, the public. Now, CircleCI is not going to do anything with it, hopefully, but again, you just have to be cognizant of free doesn't mean it's no cost. Uh, AWS, again, the same thing. Uh, it, these are just wrapped in different, uh, different scripts. So these third-party tools, awesome. Use them. That doesn't negate that first manual step. 
So, perfect, immutable-ish. I'm not gonna be able to take questions, so you can find me afterwards. So, infrastructure is code. All that means is everything you do is documented and put somewhere in a repository. So, you have all these words to talk about it, idempotent, uh, which means do it many times, and you can't tell if you did it once or a thousand times. You've got tools like Chef, uh, Habitat, Vagrant, um, this immutable server. The opposite of a immutable server is a Snowflake server, where it's a mystical server that you can't touch or change because you're not quite sure how you got to that state. Um, and, and really, uh, it's about... Uh, one of the main attractions for me with Docker is that it always starts from scratch, but it does it extremely efficiently, right? By starting from scratch, you don't have to worry about, well, you know, ah, crap, Elixir uh, 0 0.9 was on there, and uh, it didn't actually clean up properly in the 1.0s, so now I have to have my scripts know to go and check to uninstall that. If I start fresh, Elixir's not there at all. So this comes into the, the lower brown, uh, the lower light gray one, which is the images and snapshots using AMIs. So you don't need to necessarily get Docker to get that kind of efficiency. My focus is on recoverability, not scalability. I'm building $5 ideas. So what that means is instead of handling all the errors, instead of getting a three node cluster going, moving my database off to a separate server, I'm looking to improve the mean time to recovery. So let's say it goes down every day, but it sends me an email and I'm up all the time and I go and restart it so it's only down for five minutes, right? That's five minutes of mean time to recovery. Mean time to failure is maybe it only fails once a week or once a month. But when it does that, I have no scripts behind it, so it takes me three or four days to figure out how I can get back to a, to a working state. Um, I also like it because I can easily turn it on and off. So if there's an idea that I'm not exploring anymore, I just turn it off, I can save my $5. Um, I can do kind of uh, easier upgrades to replace. That's that same thing with Docker, where it gets to start from scratch. If I need to upgrade from Postgres 9.5 to 9.6, um, I need to either figure out how to do that, or again, I just start from scratch, and I build 9.6 pretty much the same way I build 9.5. So I'm not Facebook. Facebook wasn't originally Facebook. They have 15,000 employees, so don't be ashamed that uh, you know, you, you're you not spinning up a 10-node cluster, and uh, your mean time to failure is every seven years. And I can't afford a $5. I, you know, $5 doesn't get me a cluster. And if you can recover, what's a recovery? A recovery is just to spin up new. So if I can spin up new, then I could spin up 10 new, or 100 new, or 500 new. So being able to recover well uh, probably means that you will be able to scale well when the time comes. And also, you know, a lot of this is we're getting down and dirty. So there's the not invented here question that always comes up. Why aren't you just using, why aren't you just using, um, um, you know, load balancers with uh, all this fun elastic um, uh, AWS, like dynamic provisioning. Perfect, use it. I'll build the one server and then I'll create an AMI and then I'll get AWS to manage to spin up 10 when traffic spikes in that. So the work that we did wasn't negated. It, we weren't taking a left turn to then have to turn around and go back to the right. So again, by recovery, I mean I wanna be able to rebuild a production server, rebuild a release, update DNS, restore some SSL certs, uh, back up, save my database, and possibly change cloud providers. Um, so the, the reds are the, the lofty goals, the greens are the easy, and the oranges are mediocre. So the, um, we wanted to deploy some changes. But what does a change mean to your app? And I'm gonna say there's really two styles of changes. They're new or it's an improvement. So new is building something new. We're using Stripe now, we're using Box, Dropbox, we're using uh, Ubuntu 16 up from 14. We're changing from MySQL to Postgres. These are all new things. Improvements are, I'm making my uh, dashboard look better. I'm making it faster. I'm updating my copy in my text. These are all improvements. The new ones are the scary ones because that requires infrastructure change. But if I'm just changing the background to purple, then that's really just an improvement and I can do a different style of deployment for it. So try and focus on that new first. Get a zero email in. Get, um, get your uh, integration for payment in right away. 
So you're using Stripe and you want to do recurring billing. Well, don't do the recurring billing first. Just get Stripe in there with the hello world. Because then when you go to improve it, your infrastructure already knows how to get the right keys, already knows how to provision itself, and that way you're just focusing on the upgrades. But unfortunately, those lofty goals where you want to be able to rebuild a server from scratch still means all infrastructure must eventually be replaced. And that's why with my $5 ideas, I put the database right on the server. Because I know that eventually I'll need to upgrade Postgres. So having it on a separate server alleviates me from having to do that sooner than later, but I'll still have to eventually change it. So we want zero downtime? Totally we can get zero downtime. Let's do it. Uh, New York City had an elevator problem. People were complaining. They had to wait too long. Got engineers in, said cost was too expensive, building was too old. And the story goes that a uh, psychology major comes in and says, well, the problem is that it's the perception that their complaint is too slow. So what was the solution? They put mirrors up, okay? So zero downtime does not mean that you are 100% up. It means you're not 0% well, that's, and double negative. Yeah, you're not 100% down, sorry. So what I mean by this is that you can turn features off. You can make it read-only access. Um, you can even put a be right back in place. So again, hey, we're doing a small deploy. Going to do a little be right back. And the last thing that we will do is a little poke. So on the server, did I lose? Uh, all right, perfect. So I'm going to go into my source, my releases directory. It's got my name UI. I've added a custom script to enable feature flags. And I'm going to enable, be right back. So this is the automation piece. And now, is that? Now it's off. There's no rights to the database. It's fully off. I can go on there and hack away at it. And we'll leave it off so that we don't get any more inappropriate <laughs> words up there. Tisk tisk. <laughs> All right. So again, this is a smaller deploy. Just I like to leave little breadcrumbs. This is the bigger one with some dad jokes. Um, and uh, how I do this is plug. I just add in a be right back. Um, this here is just a feature flag. So I can just check, hey, is be right back enabled or not enabled? And this is available through that version tasks as a code generator. So it can sniff out your project and write you that feature flag for you. So why would you need to be right back? Most likely because you screwed up, right? You did deploy, it didn't work, or you had an upgrade you thought could hot swap and couldn't. So then you need to get on there, shut things down, work through it. And last night, Node decided it needed more than 500 megs to deploy. So I had this just last night. So I had to figure out how to do it. Manually was, hey, I had to learn a little bit about uh, swap. And then I had to codify the script. And then I triggered a, a major release, and that rebuilt it. So we're going to watch kind of a server being built. I've got 70 seconds. So server boils down to your operating system with a bunch of operating system tools, so like Postgres or you're using uh, Unix shell tools. Your data, here just a database, any kind of configuration, both environment variables and log, uh, configs, and your actual code. So uh, if you download the slides, you'll see the talk a little bit about DigitalOcean. I've got uh, a library with tons of downloads for interacting with the API. Um, and uh, so there's a, there's a little bit more now. Uh, it's a wrapper to their, their API service so you can build infrastructure. Uh, it's an eScript or a mixed task. So if you want to run it globally on a server without a project, you can. Um, it uses Bash behind, behind the scenes. For backwards uh, and forwards compatibility, the rest is all exposed. But because it's my library, because it's a wrapper in Elixir, you're probably doing Elixir, so um, I have a few uh, things here called like imagelets, which helps you build a Phoenix image or an Elixir image. It's an opinionated image, but if you're not into infrastructure and you spin up a Phoenix image, then what do you care if it's Ubuntu 16 and not CoreOS? 
So this would be how, for instance, you create that imagelet. Bunch of DigitalOcean, bunch of Erlang, warm up time, and I'm going to stop it here. My time is up. If you have questions, I'm taking the red eye. Uh, I'll feel free to, to come find me, and thanks again.